We left at a time of rejoicing, didn't we, at the end of the Feast of Tabernacles in Nehemiah chapter 8, and there's a little picture of them building their little booths, even in the shadow of the wall that they had just finished, to remind them of what really counts as far as God is concerned, that he will provide for all of our needs, for our shelter, for the beauty of the fragrance of the myrtle trees, for the protection of the pine trees, and for the peace of the palm trees, which we all look forward to in the future, and which we experience in this life. So we left them at the end of Nehemiah chapter 8, and we'll turn to the start of Nehemiah chapter 9. Now, there is a time for rejoicing, and there is a time for mourning. We know that from the wise man in in, um, Ecclesiastes, and we know it from our lives also, don't we? We all experience that. Well, in Nehemiah chapter 9, it was just two days later. The Feast of Tabernacles went from the 15th till the 21st of the seventh month. Then came the eighth day, which we read of in verse 18 of chapter 8. And then we come in verse 1 of chapter 9, where we read now in the 20 and fourth day of this month, two days later, the children of Israel were assembled with fasting and with sackcloths and with earth upon them. So they had returned from the great rejoicing that they had experienced. It seems that they had then reflected on their own lives, the reality of their lives. And we do that. We share in equal parts with rejoicing in the truth, but also with reflection and sometimes with mourning at the way each of us perhaps individually have behaved. And that never ends in our life in the truth, doesn't it? It doesn't matter what age we are, uh, and I've probably made a few ageist comments this weekend, so I apologise for that, but I know as I get older I realise that the problem's never going to go away. There's never going to be a time, and we do have some young members of the audience, but there's never going to be a time when I can say, yes, at last I've conquered the problem of sin. It just won't happen. And for the children of Israel, after the great rejoicing of chapter 8 and looking forward to the future and all the blessings of God, they then came to reflect upon their own lives again. And, of course, as happens when we examine ourselves, they realised that they were falling short of what they really wanted to be in service to God. And so in verse 1 of chapter 9, fasting with sackcloth and earth upon them returned. And the seed of Israel in verse 2 separated themselves from all strangers, foreigners, and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. So it seems that what had happened is buoyed with inspiration from all that Ezra had taught them and the other Levites and the great experience of rejoicing of the Feast of Tabernacles and the eighth day which spoke of the kingdom and the millennium and beyond, they then reflected on their own lives. They looked around at their own ecclesial environment and they saw that the problems that Ezra had sought to correct for them 12 years before hadn't been totally corrected as the problems in our lives had never totally corrected. There were still strangers amongst them. There was still that problem of mingling with the world and that was impacting on their behaviour. And when they saw that, they again repented. And the action that they took in verse 3 was very good. The response to that repentance was they stood up in their place and they read in the book of the law of Yahweh their God one fourth part of the day and another fourth part they confessed and worship Yahweh their God. So they went back and did the same thing like we do, week after week after week after week after year after decade. We continue to come back around the table of the Lord to examine ourselves, to be disappointed with how we've fared, but to think about the salvation of our Lord, that burnt offering that is on the table every week for us, and we leave, hopefully, from our memorial meeting once again, buoyed and rejoicing in the wonderful hope that we have. And we come back the following week. And this really, in in essence, is what they were doing here at the start of chapter 9. They had reflected on their own lives and they saw that they had let God down. And so a process began that we're going to see led to a renewal of 
a form of a covenant with God by this people. And I think that's a good example for us too. The first thing they did was to pray. And from verse uh, 6 down to verse 38 of Nehemiah chapter 9 is a wonderful prayer that was prayed on this occasion. Now, at the start of verse 4, it says that the Levites stood up. I'm not going to attempt to read all of those names because our reading brother did such a wonderful job. (laughs) And he did. But all of these Levites stood up. Now, the RSV at the start of verse 6 inserts the words, and Ezra said. Now, I'm not sure whether Ezra actually prayed this prayer or not, but I think if he didn't pray it, in all probability, he wrote it out and the Levites read the prayer that Ezra had written. I think this was Ezra's prayer. And we won't go through the prayer in detail. Likewise, we didn't go through the prayer back in Ezra, but they are wonderful prayers. This was a a man of, of great prayer. So just very briefly, this lengthy prayer from verse 6 down to verse 38 is really the thoughts of Ezra trying to encompass the feelings of the people as he represented them before God. It starts talking about, in verse 6, the creation, the wonderful power of God. He talks about the promises in verse 7 and 8, just like we do in our prayers. He talks about the salvation of God, how that he had saved them from Egypt. He says in verse 17, Thou art a God ready to pardon, gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and forsookest them not. And we remember the character of God before him, don't we? He's revealed himself to us as merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abundance in goodness and truth. So we do well in our ecclesial and private prayers to remember to God what he is. He likes us to do that. It's not repetitive. It's not disrespectful. It's what God loves to hear. And then down towards the end of the prayer, it contains confession in verse 34. They said, neither have our priests, our princes, our our kings, our princes, our priests, nor our fathers kept thy law, nor hearkened unto thy commandments and thy testimonies, wherewith thou didst testify against them. For they have not served thee in their kingdom, and in thy great goodness that thou gavest them in the large and fat land which thou gavest before them, neither turned they from their wicked works. It was a very solemn, sincere and honest confession. And then at the end, behold, we are slaves this day. And for the land that thou gavest unto our fathers to eat the fruit thereof and the good thereof, behold, we are slaves in it. And whilst life for those that went back from Babylon, enriched by the contribution of the king on their journey, nonetheless, the reality was they were will, they were servants or slaves of the Persians. Verse 37, it yieldeth much increase under the kings whom thou hast set over us because of our sins. Also they have dominion over our bodies and over our cattle at their pleasure, and we are in great distress. So as much as through Ezra they had received great blessing from the king, Nonetheless, the reality of the situation was that they were still slaves of the Persian Empire. And all of the good of the land which they were experiencing didn't really belong to them anymore. So that which they had once had had been taken from them. And they felt that and they confessed that. But up in verse 33, they said something very important, something all of us say and acknowledge. They said, how be it thou art just in all that is brought upon us for thou hast done right but we have done wickedly and of course that's a key to serving God isn't it it's to declare the righteousness of God and that's what they did thou art just you have done right and we have done wickedly and really in part that's one of the foundations of what it takes to serve God in spirit and in truth as represented by the life and the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, though he faced horrible suffering, in the end, of course, bowed himself to the will of his heavenly Father and declared God's righteousness. So these people have been brought to a wonderful position by that Bible school, by the work of Ezra and others and Nehemiah, 
in helping them to come to this position that, God, you are right and we were wrong and we are still suffering because of that wrong, but that doesn't mean that, God, you are wrong. They have great hope for the future, but they also have great honesty about the present. Now, what they did in chapter 10 was basically to put together not a replacement covenant for the law of Moses, but a summary from themselves, a kind of statement of faith, if you like. I've mentioned the statement of faith a couple of times. Um, the statement of faith, of course, is a helpful document. Um, I think it's a very, a very helpful document. And sometimes these days I hear uh, people critical of the statement of faith uh, or make other comments about the statement of faith. Well, it's certainly not divinely inspired, but it's been a very helpful document for our ecclesia world for many years. And so um, I think this is the sort of thing that they were putting together now in Nehemiah chapter 10, verse 38 of the previous chapter, at the end of that great prayer, they said, and because of all this, we make a sure covenant and write it. And our princes, Levites and priests seal unto it. So they had the law of Moses and they were well taught in the law of Moses by Ezra, but they wanted something extra. They wanted to write down something that they felt they wanted to offer to God uh, as their basis of service, if you like, their basis of fellowship. And it contained nine provisions. We won't go into them. They saw the problem of alien marriages and so part of the covenant, part of the agreement was that alien marriages were forbidden, that they would observe the Sabbath, they would observe the year of release, the Jubilee, they would observe the annual payment that was specified under the law of Moses, the price of redemption. The wood offering would continue. The first fruits of their crops and herds would be paid. Tithes would be made available for the Levites and provision would be made available for the temple and the temple workers. So they put in place that very simple document, an agreement that they, they wanted to make with God, in addition to the law of Moses, which they already understood. And the governor signed it, the priests signed it, the Levites signed it, the chiefs of the people signed it, and the people themselves signed it. This was their response to, I suppose, their self-examination, their understanding of where they'd gone wrong, their appreciation of the blessings of God, the education they'd received from Ezra and others, all of this culminated in this document. And I don't believe it was a document that, that God was displeased with. In fact, I think quite the opposite. He was very pleased to see his people reflecting on their ecclesia and saying, well, these are the things that we want our ecclesia to stand for. And so, um, unfortunately, of course, like all of us, and I suppose like all ecclesia, as time went by, um, they broke many, many of the things that they had agreed they could, that they would do, and we all do that. But it was a good start for them uh, in chapter 10 and a further testament to the work of Ezra. All right, so the Old Testament ended with the Jewish people re-established in their land, as we have seen in a very great part due to the work of Ezra and those other good figs that Jeremiah had spoken of. When we think that during the time from Malachi to the Lord Jesus Christ, the people of Israel now would live under six different forms of government. The Persian Empire was ruling at the time of Ezra, but they would pass. Then would follow the Greek Empire, then the Ptolemies of Egypt ruled for a time. The Seleucids of Syria took over for a time. And of course, Antiochus the Great came into Jerusalem and defiled the temple. There would be a period of self-rule under the Maccabees, albeit with the oversight of the Romans. And then finally, the Romans themselves would take over the rule of that land, all in the next 400 or so years. And each of those different Empires brought their different culture to the Jews. The Persians, the Greeks, the Romans, the Ptolemies, they were all very different and they all brought pressures into ecclesial life. Nonetheless, thanks to the work of Ezra and others and the wonderful providence of God, the word of God 
had become the central focus of their worship. And we've said this a few times, and it's an important lesson out of the life of the ready scribe. The word of God had become the centre of, the, of their worship. And the word of God never changes. So the Bible became their inspiration as they waited for the word made flesh to be manifest amongst them. And of course, if you look at the prophecies of Daniel in particular, the other thing that they had going for them was like us. We're similar, aren't we? We've got no open vision as it's expressed, as they were in those dark, sometimes called dark ages after the days of Ezra, etc. But they had the words of the prophets like we have. They had the prophecies of Daniel and they could tick things off during that 400 year period that told them that God was still at work, still at work, just as we can do. And of course, when the Lord Jesus Christ arrived, they were ready for him, some of them, and they were looking faithfully because they saw that the advent of the Lord was very near, as we see the same thing now. So Ezra's work had been successful. There had been a reformation carried out amongst the children of Israel who came back from Babylon. We have seen that he was a very careful civil servant who liked to do things decently and in order. And there's nothing wrong with doing things decently and in order. He was a very honest man. He was trusted by some of the greatest kings in Old Testament history, particularly Darius, who was a very great king, who totally trusted in Ezra because he was a very honest man. He bravely led the second Aaliyah, the second return to the land from Babylon, even in the midst of great personal disappointment. As we said, the hall is not always full of interested friends. The ecclesia doesn't always respond to the wonderful ideas that are put before them. But there was never a hint from Ezra of being disgruntled towards God about that. He ploughed on full of enthusiasm, even though there was only 1,000, what was it, 764 in the end that followed him back. He led them bravely back through a very dangerous journey. He dealt with great problems as soon as he arrived and he dealt with them with great compassion, didn't he? That difficult problem of mixed marriages and what to do about it or mixed relationships, if you like, and what to do about them. He fell on his face in humility and the people responded and said to him, whatever you want us to do, we'll do it. We can't lead ourselves out of this position, Ezra, but we believe that you can. And if you are brave enough to do it, we will be brave enough to follow you. And he provided a mixture of compassion and firm direction. He convinced the people to turn away from false women and to worship Yahweh. They joined him in prayer to God, prayer of confession, and they fell in love with their Bible to the extent that they, they stood up and stayed standing up for six hours. Amazing. And they did it again and again and again. Not that standing up was important, at all, but that they were just overcome with the emotion of the occasion, um, and probably the tall ones wanted a better view. I can understand that. So they stood up. They fell in love with their Bible, and I think all of us are in love with our Bible. I really do. In the conversations that we've had, and we want to make sure that we pass that feeling on to future generations. And there are some wonderful brothers and sisters who are younger who also love their Bible, and it's a great thrill to see that, and we want to make sure, young and old, that we share with others the great passion that we feel for this wonderful book. In the end, they agreed to a covenant, a, an agreement amongst themselves and with God to say, this is what we will do to follow you. So they were a great example. All of these things are a great example to us. And whilst we're not in exactly the same situation as them, it's a similar situation, isn't it? It's a period of waiting in some ways of darkness. We have no open vision, although we have more than enough prophecy to excite us as we await for the return of our Lord. But we also have great pressures on the ecclesia, pressures from within, pressures from without. And they had the same pressures. As I said, it, it's very encouraging to see the ecclesia in this age and in every age facing similar pressures and doing similar things. They got together in Bible schools and Bible classes and conferences and they had people break the word down small for them. 
We're not reinventing anything. We're simply following in the way that the ecclesia of God has always followed. And I find that very comforting and very helpful. We saw that, in a word, there were three figures that were outstanding in that era of all of those good figs. And we said that Jeremiah was for preparation, that Daniel was for continuation, and that Ezra was for reformation. And I wonder when I read those things, what I wonder what my word is or I wonder what your word is. What is your talent? What is my talent? There might be several of them, but we can summarise the talents of those men and there are a myriad of things that we can do in the ecclesia that we are talented at doing. Remember all those, remember the description of the knives and the spoons and the bowls and the basins and all of the things that, Ezra wrote down very carefully. It doesn't matter what our service is in the truth. If we do that faithfully and enthusiastically, it all means the same to God, and he is thrilled to see that, as he was to see the, the, the works of those three very faithful men. Jeremiah had called them all good figs, and God said he was, would set his eyes on them for good, and so he did. What Ezra wrote was true. The good hand of God was on them. They survived and they prospered for a time. And he will continue to be with all of those who want to follow him in spirit and in truth. And so we come to our day and the clock ticks on, doesn't it, as we await the return of our Lord for the day when we will see all of these people again. And so we want to see the example of Ezra and try to follow that example. So I hope it's been good for us to be together this weekend. We've enjoyed it very much. We thank you for your hospitality and for getting to know some of you. The um, accommodation we've been provided with has been superb and the hospitality of Ken and Sue is wonderful, as I'm sure you all realise, and it's lovely to get to know those at Southport a little better. So thank you very much and it's nice to think of ecclesias in different parts of the country and around the world who we're all doing basically the same things and i find that very comforting it's like when i see people that i haven't seen for 10 or 20 or 30 years and you come across them at a conference or a bible school and you think well there's someone that i knew a while back and they're still enduring they're still going and that's very encouraging and, and seeing different ecclesias and thinking well we're all we are all doing essentially the same things. We're trying to serve God in the same way, in the same way they did in the first century and in the days of Ezra. So thank you very much for having us. Now, there was one more task for Ezra, and we're going to finish by having a look at this final task in Nehemiah chapter 12. And this was the ceremony of the dedication of the wall. In verse 27 of Nehemiah chapter 12, at the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem, they sought the Levites out of all of their places to bring them to Jerusalem to keep the dedication with gladness, with thanksgiving, with singing, with cymbals, psalteries and with harps. So this was a great occasion of rejoicing. The altar's finished, the temple's finished, the wall's finished. We've got a new um, covenant that we've made with God, which is not in place of the law of Moses, but it's just something that we have wanted to agree to, to rededicate ourselves in the service of God. It's a wonderful time. So, so we might ask who was to be the leader of this great ceremony. And we know that there were two leaders of this great ceremony. One of them was Nehemiah and the other one, of course, was Ezra. By now, a very old man getting towards 90 years of age. But nonetheless, a man still alive with the things of the truth. And they went forward in two groups. We read about that in verse 31 and then in verse 36 to 38. So let's just, we won't worry about reading all those names again. Let's trace the steps that they put. There's a, a little diagram of the walls of Jerusalem that they were there to dedicate. Now, one group, Ezra's group, went right at the towards the dung gate and made its way up to the water gate. And it says in verse 36 that that group had Ezra the scribe before them. 
The other group went in the other direction, and we, as a, again, we're not going to go through the details of all of their names. They went at the uh, in the other direction, and they came to the prison gate, and it says that Nehemiah was following after them in verse 38. So that's what the situation was. So picture this wonderful old brother. I imagine the people are all down on the ground watching what's going up on the wall, up on the walls. And Ezra goes up, probably not easy for him to climb to the top of the walls at that age. And he begins to walk to the right, along to the dung gate, left at the fountain gate, up to the water gate. And he stops there in the group behind him. And I imagine that they would have been fascinated to watch their dear older brother leading that procession. And then the other direction goes the group behind, uh, in front of Nehemiah. And Nehemiah says that he followed on behind them. And verse 40 says, So the two companies of them that gave thanks in the house of God and I and the half of the rulers with me. So they stopped walking at the water gate and at the prison gate, the two groups. Now between the two groups lay the east gate. And I think that's interesting, and I'll use a little speculation as we try to close this scene. I think it was a, a day of great rejoicing after all of the work that they'd put in, and to see those two men up on the wall, Ezra and Nehemiah, the young, um, enthusiastic brother that had caused them to rebuild the walls, and, of course, Ezra, who had been with them now for many years, their spiritual leader. There they were, stopped at the water gate and the prison gate, and in between them was the east gate. And eventually they came together and climbed down from the walls and celebrated. Now, what was Ezra thinking about at this point? I don't know what he was thinking about. It's not recorded. But Ezra was around 20 years of age when the great prophet Ezekiel had died. And I am sure that a ready scribe like Ezra knew all of the words of Ezekiel off by heart. And there he stood really above the east gate with the other group led by or followed by Nehemiah on the other side. And in Ezekiel chapter 11, we won't worry about turning to it unless you want to, verse 23, the prophet had said, The glory of Yahweh went up from the city and stood on the east side of the city. And Ezra, from his position on the wall, could look out to the east over that side and he could see the Mount of Olives and he could think about the words of Ezekiel, which he must have thought about at that point the man who was a ready scribe and knew his Bible so well. And Ezra had been there as a little tiny baby. He wouldn't be able to remember it, but he was there when the children of Israel had moved outside of the city onto the Mount of Olives on the right-hand side before the East Gate. That was his childhood. What did the prophet say next? The Spirit brought me into Chaldea to them of the captivity. And as Ezra stood there on that gate and thought about the words of Ezekiel and looked out to the Mount of Olives and beyond, that was his life. That was the first 75 years of his life, beyond those mountains, off to Babylon in the distance to captivity for 75 years. And what would you have thought of next? Well, Ezekiel chapter 43. He brought me to the gate that looketh toward the east, said the prophet, and behold, the glory of the God of Israel came from the way of the east. This is Ezekiel 43, if you want to note it down. And behold, the glory of Yahweh filled the house, and there stood Ezra above the east gate, looking out to the east, and imagine in his mind the time when the Lord Jesus Christ will come from the east go through the east gate and return to the temple. An ancient man he was, but full of youthful hope. To be sure, the ultimate prince that he saw in that vision of Ezekiel chapter 40 and beyond wasn't there yet, but Ezra knew that he would be. And he knew that in the grace and the mercy of God, he would be there to see it. So it was in verse 43 of Nehemiah chapter 12, 
They descended from the walls and they offered great sacrifices and they rejoiced. And it says, so that the joy of Jerusalem was heard even afar off. What an occasion it must have been. And that's the end of the life of Ezra, the ready scribe. He was ready to serve God when his moment came. In his case, it's 75 years of age before we hear of him. And the reason he was ready was summed up very simply, as only a truly great scribe, a scribe can. Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of Yahweh and to do it and to teach in Israel statutes and judgments.